on the brink of a bear market from New York City for our viewers worldwide. I'm Lisa Abramowitz in for Jonathan Farrow. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. We begin with the big issue stuck between a rock and a hard place. We haven't seen a blink from central bankers. Yes, we're squarely in a slowdown. Real wages are declining. Everybody knows that inflation is going to be sticky. Every single month, this is a consumer that loses purchasing power. We've got the choice between two very bad choices. There's a risk of stagflation and there's a risk of recession. Despite all of these leading indicators, we have not seen the central banks blink. That soft landing, landing path has become ever more unlikely from Friday onwards. But this does definitely put 75 on the Table. We absolutely think they should hike by 75 basis points. That would send panic signals uh, across uh, global markets. I would be sort of really doubting that we get a 75 basis point hike out of the blue. The hope that bad news would be good news and, and create a reversal in this market is just falling away in front of us. The problem really for risk assets in total is, is sort of it's, it's in a conundrum. What would make the Fed blink? What would they blink to, given that inflation is the predominant concern? Joining us now to discuss Invesco's Christina Hooper and Aberdeen's James Athey. Christina, what's your sense of why we're seeing such a market move today, particularly led by the front end of the yield curve? Well, Lisa, I think about Friday's CPI print as the Fed's bigger boat moment. <clears throat> so you may recall in Jaws, there's this moment in time where Chief Brody is chumming and he actually sees the great white shark for the first time and realizes it's much bigger than he had anticipated. And he uttered to his um, shipmates, we, we're going to need a bigger boat. Um, Friday's CPI print was that bigger boat moment. And that, that's why markets are reacting the way they are, because they believe the Fed is going to be forced to get more aggressive than they had expected. Christina, is 75 basis points in July the bigger boat? Uh, it could very well be. But we also have to think about the bigger boat in terms of a series of rate hikes. So we're definitely going to get more by the end of this year than previously anticipated. And we could get that 75 basis point rate hike at the next meeting. James, do you agree? I, l I love the Jaws analogy to start with. <laughs> That's a great one. Um, honestly, I don't know. Infl I, c I come on this show, you know, and I, I, I give the same answer when asked about inflation. I, I don't know. It's it's a, a poorly understood concept. It's a highly complicated concept. And right now, it's probably never been more difficult. I think the inflation outcomes are the most important driver of Fed policy going forward. I certainly don't think that a 75 basis point hike is out of the question. I definitely think the Fed would like to probably give a bit of guidance before they take that additional step. In the near term, I, I slightly disagree with Christina in the sense that I don't think that that single print necessarily changes it's, you know, changes things so dramatically. Ultimately, core was lower. Year-on-year -year core has now been lower for three uh, prints in a row. Um, and, you know, it's going to be the path of inflation from here, which is going to be most important for Fed policy, because at the moment, the market is priced for inflation to bounce around about 8.5% for a few prints, and then it's a seven handle, and then a six handle quite quickly. That's what the market is pricing. If that is the path that plays out, no, I don't think we're talking about increasing the pace of hikes to 75, and I don't think we're talking about a higher and higher terminal rate. But if, if we fail to see, you know, that's a reasonably uh, rapid decline in, in headline inflation over this three to six month period, then absolutely the Fed will feel compelled to push harder. James, just quickly here, we're looking at a lot of these moves being driven by the two-year yield now at 3.18%. It had been well above 3.2% uh, earlier in the trading session. Do you think that this is overpricing the hawkishness where we are right now? No, I don't think so. Actually, the conversation we were having as a team last week was that all of a sudden, the Fed being probably the most consistently hawkish across their committee and for a period of time, notwithstanding some of the smaller central banks, but certainly amongst the majors, the Fed has been more consistently hawkish. And yet the US front end actually looked the least aggressively priced, certainly to what relative to what they were saying. Uh, you know, a two-year yield is going to be an average rate of, of the policy rate over that period. And what we're not seeing, interestingly, in the strip is a dynamic which 
we had seen earlier in this cycle, which was that when we were pricing in more and more hikes in the near term, we were kind of stealing them from uh, the two or three year view and getting this big inversion. It's not really happening now. Uh, the market is just pricing a flatlining of, of Fed policy rates. And I think when the history is written, maybe that will be the mistake, because ultimately I yeah. still think this is a, a an aggressive uh, up and then probably quite an aggressive down in terms of commodity prices, inflation and then Fed policy. And perhaps a lot of people would agree with you right now. It is the up move that is getting a lot of attention with the pressure very much front and center for the Federal Reserve. Wall Street starting to price in an outside rate hike, uh, possibly as soon as this Wednesday with Barclays and Jefferies and Nomura. They are all looking for 75 basis points at this meeting. For more, Bloomberg's Michael McKee joins us now. Mike. <laughs> Good morning, Lisa. I love Christina's uh, Jaws analogy, except for one thing. Uh, looking at the shark was a contemporaneous concurrent indicator, whereas the CPI really, on Mike? Friday <laughs> is looking backwards. And here's something to consider. Uh, the Fed has only just begun. Look at how many times in these previous inflation peaks the Fed had been raising rates for quite some time. They've only raised rates twice, and that's only the month of uh, May. So we're not getting any a lot of reaction yet in the uh, CPI because the Fed has only just begun its tightening. Where does it leave us for Wednesday? Well, they said they're going to do 50. I've gone back and forth on this. I think they're going to do 50 because the Fed doesn't really like to surprise people and doesn't want to scare the markets into thinking there's something terrible going on. But we could see guidance from Jay Powell that they will consider 75 at the next meeting. And the way the markets have front run the Fed that could do the work of a 75 basis point hike for them. And then uh, we're going to be looking at the dot plot. That's going to be everybody's first uh, thing that they look at on Wednesday because they want to see what the terminal rate's going to be and how fast it, they're going to have to go in order to get there. Meantime, how bad are things? Well, the two-year, 10-year is very close to inverting and going back and forth over that zero line. But look at the three-month 10-year. They're not going anywhere. They're still way above. So do we have a recession in the future? We don't know. The markets don't know. The Fed doesn't know. That's why you have to stay tuned to the open. On <laughs> Michael McKee there uh, with a rebuttal to the Jaws uh, analogy. We'll get Christina's response to that in a bit. But Car Barclays is positioning for a slowdown and persistent price increase, uh, writing, quote, inflation is now dominating policy and likely starting to impact growth as well. Central banks have an increasingly difficult line to tread. We position for slowing growth and persistent inflation, overweight value and defensives to hedge inflation. We are still here uh, with Christina and, uh, and, and James. Christina, from your perspective, we have seen such an incredible sell-off in the tech space in particular with about a 3% decline today. We're talking about the correction in the S&P, but really the Nasdaq has been brutalized uh, this year. When do you start to buy again? Well, you can start to selectively buy as long as your dollar cost averaging now. I mean, there are attractive parts of the tech sector. Um, some areas like spec tech we want to stay away from, um, but there are some areas that are attractive and I would argue uh, have some defensive characteristics. Uh, so, so this is a time to be selective, but I wouldn't sit on my hands. I, I would start to dollar cost average in uh, to some of, of the attractive opportunities in the space. James, what about you? Yeah, I wouldn't be in quite such a rush. I, I mean, I agree with Christina in the sense that there's there's good and there's bad, and there's ugly, all with under the, under the uh, um, umbrella of tech. And certainly, the more spec names, those that were just so richly valued, have come down a lot, and they still look richly valued to me. Uh, I think, as we saw at the back end of the 90s, beginning of the noughties, there are also probably some growth names, tech names, which uh, you know masquerading as growth and actually have more cyclicality than than investors realise. And so, my concern here is that all we've really seen in the equity market over this last uh, few months is a derating, essentially taking out a lot of the the pandemic-related froth and other froth. The reality is that earnings forecasts still look pretty robust to me, and earnings are. I don't know, 30% above trend, if you call 7% earnings growth the trend. But we're still way above that, and yet we're talking about recessionary conditions. We're talking about dramatic macro headwinds, really huge macro headwinds, um, and we've not seen those earnings numbers come down. And once they do, obviously, valuations can get richer again during that process, and therefore there is still the potential for some meaningful downside. So equities in general, specifically in the US, I'm still pretty cautious here because I still think we've got some wood to chop. Uh, with respect to the macro and policy outlook.
Of course, big tech and the call for it, some people would argue, is the haven call amid a slew of uncertainty and fear of a hard landing. The team at Deutsche Bank growing wary of the potential for a soft landing, uh, writing, quote, guiding inflation back to target without triggering a recession has gotten that much more difficult. Achieving such a soft landing looks very unlikely given the degree of tightening needed to combat the seemingly endless stream of inflationary shocks. Christina, going back to that JAWS analogy, do you think that the soft landing is off the table now? And it's really about uh, dusting off the playbook for a hard landing for a recession and how to position ahead of that. No, I actually don't believe a soft landing is off the table. Now, admittedly, it becomes more difficult the more aggressive Fed tightening gets. Um, but my view is that while markets believe the Fed needs a bigger boat, it may not actually need a bigger boat. It may need to talk tucker, to, uh, talk tougher. Excuse me. Um, it may need to be more aggressive uh, in the next few um, Fed meetings. But we could end the year with a Fed that actually does less tightening than the market currently anticipates. And there is upside potential in that. Um, and, and certainly, uh, it could be that the Fed is able to thread that needle um, and manage a soft landing. James, you were saying that the U.S., particularly in the equity space, isn't particularly attractive. Where else is better right now on the risk asset side, given the fact that the U.S. actually has a stronger backdrop than many other places? Yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. I think the, <clears throat> the starting point might, might have been more egregious overvaluation in the U.S., but some of that was justified given the, the, you know, the, the companies that make up the index, but also just structural growth and economic health in the U.S. I look elsewhere and I see even greater challenges. You know, Europe, uh, and I include the U.K. in that, has a much, much worse stagflation trade-off, a growth inflation trade-off. And if the ECB tries to deal with that as they are at the moment, fair play to them, they are trying to deal with that at the moment, but uh, the disruption that that can create in financial markets and ultimately economies is quite concerning in the UK. I'm a little more concerned that the Bank of England is not being as aggressive in trying to deal with it, and that could conjure forth balance of payments forces, which have been uh, incredibly damaging in the past. So everywhere you look, they've got their own challenges. None of them look good. Ultimately, there's a high degree of correlation globally between cyclical assets, and I think we are talking about a global slowdown. I think we're talking about global recession, myself personally. So for now, um, I choose to be much more cautiously positioned. That's very uh, gloomy. Uh, James, we hope you're wrong, although there are a lot of people who probably agree with you. James Athey and Christina Hooper are sticking with us. We want to get a sense of the movement in markets right now as we are poised for a bear market in the S&P with a look at the stocks moving ahead of the opening bell. Abigail Doolittle. Well, Lisa, keeping with that gloomy view, yes, it's a brutal market here for stocks. The index is down well more than 2%. The S&P 500 futures, as you're mentioning, in a bear market right now, trying to find support. It's going to be really interesting to see what happens today. This of course, on inflation fears, the idea that the Fed will have to hike very aggressively, as you all have been talking about, potentially yield soaring. Now, the yield curve, however, based off of last week, uh, has really flattened. That's weighing on banks. JP Morgan Citigroup both down more than 2%. We also have tech down sharply. That, of course, is one of the most rate sensitive sectors as rising yields create uh, a valuation concern. Everything gets more expensive, as you know, Lisa, with rates rising, liquidity draining. We're set up right now for a brutal open for stocks. Yeah, definitely. And we'll be watching that. Uh, Abigail, thank you so much. Coming up, U.S. equities teetering on the edge of yet another bear market. We've had four occasions in the last 35 years where the market just avoided a bear market, literally closing down 19.9% and then turning into a bull market. And that conversation coming up next. And based on where we are in futures, we are poised to open in a bear market with the S&P uh, down uh, right now about more than 2%. And the NASDAQ leading the way lower, as Abby was talking about, given the rate sensitivity there. This is Bloomberg. We've had four occasions in the last 35 years where the market just avoided a bear market, literally closing down 19.9% and then turning into a bull market. But on each of those four occasions, you had a Fed doing a major pivot, either cutting rates or finishing tightening. And I just can't see that happening this time around.
The global risk route intensifying stocks flirting with another bear market. Treasury yields trading at multi-year highs. Rabobank weighing in, writing, quote, collapsing consumer sentiment, unexpectedly intense price pressures, and expectations of Fed activism are conspiring to create a particularly toxic cocktail for risk assets. Bloomberg's Taylor Riggs joining us now. Let's talk about that toxic cocktail for risk assets. Lisa, we have a great board showing that it really feels like a bond kind of day. When you think about rate of change, a huge increase now for six straight sessions of yield higher. Some of the biggest weekly moves that we had last week in the two-year yield since 2008. But as you know, it's also a huge equity story, right? With the NASDAQ 100, with the S&P nearing that bear market. You've talked all about that this morning. But also when you think about classic risky assets, crude, is higher prices really a cure for, well, some of the demand. We're going to find that out in the crude market today. And copper, as we know, sort of a bellwether gauge on the economy, certainly getting hit a little bit this morning off about 2%. But really, it really comes down to the bond story for me, Lisa. And I know that you've been watching this when you thought about the brief inversion here of the twos, tens, and really a huge focus here on the front end of the yield curve as a lot of market analysts are now really looking for 75 basis point hikes sometime coming by December. I could do all about the bond market if we think that that's where the smart money is, but we'll also talk about the futures as well. I know that we're watching some of the key levels here when we think about where we are in a bear market, maybe around a 38, 36 level, but so far as you can see, we're here right off just about 20%. Remember, it wasn't really that far away from that big record high that we had just to start the year. Taylor Riggs, thank you so much. JP Morgan's David Leibovitz and Morgan Stanley's Dan Skelly saying last week uh, they were staying focused on the stock positioning amid the inflation shock. Take a listen. Everybody knows that inflation is going to be sticky. We have to differentiate between the markets and the economy. The question that we need to be asking ourselves is, what does this inflation mean for purchasing power and consumption? We continue to favor those global franchises with pricing, with brand equity, that are, frankly, winning share in this environment. In those types of businesses, those sectors, those industries um, that have operating leverage, that tends to be more of a value trade. Still with us, we are so lucky to have Christina Hooper and James Athey. Christina, how closely are you watching the consumer and potential deterioration and how that uh, really affects the risk asset positioning? Oh, well, we absolutely have to follow the consumer closely. Not just sentiment, but of course, there's concern about the increase in credit card debt and debt in general. So we want to follow that closely. Um, but I'm following it not just from uh, the perspective of the impact on risk assets. I think it's also important to be following it because there is the potential to impact inflation, right? Inflation has this funny way of helping to control inflation by cooling demand. Uh, and so if we see consumer sentiment going down, um, if we see real incomes going down, that could mean a slowing of demand, which is what the Fed is looking for. There are some sources of inflation that the Fed can't solve for, as we know. Um, but what it can do is cool demand. And so if it's able to achieve those goals, um, then it means that there's less tightening that it needs um, later this year. So, so I I think it's important to be following this, but for a variety of reasons. And of course, people hear all this gloom and they look at the tape this morning and they wonder where they can hide. Investors have been piling into cash and stocks amid market headwinds. Not exactly the pair you'd expect. Bank of America writing, quote, inflation shock not over, rates shock just starting, growth shock coming, no release valve from bear, uh, peak in yields, bear market rally to consensus. James, where is the hiding spot right now, given the fact that inflation is eroding the value of cash, that sort of bifurcation right now that you're getting cash and stocks because stocks are a better hedge? What's your view? You're intentionally asking me these questions to make me sound incredibly miserable on the outlook. Aren't you, Lisa? <laughs> I'm not Thank doing you. this to you, James. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you for that. Where do you hide? Wow. I mean, the starting point, if we go back, I mean, even if you go back pre-pandemic, but certainly if you go back to the middle of the immediately post-pandemic period, the starting point was every single asset, financial and non-financial, was about as richly valued as it had probably been in history. And certainly the aggregate overvaluation of assets was on a scale that we've never seen before. As just a starting point, as a long-term investor, not somebody who's trying to make money tomorrow and next week, but somebody who's trying to invest based on a medium-term outlook, that doesn't leave you many options. In the short-term, valuation doesn't matter. In the long-term, it's all that matters. And history says if you buy equities at 30 PE, you don't do as well as if you buy them at 10 PE. So 
really in a situation like this where all the tailwinds have become headwinds the bond market is obviously adding two problems because central banks are having to to catch up and tighten so aggressively it's very difficult to find somewhere to hide out cash precious metals some people may may choose to to see value in in certain alternative assets or crypto or have you but um, yeah. a, certainly a significant cash portion, uh, some diversification, diversification globally. Chinese government bond yields have been pretty steady, pretty stable through this period. Um, you may have lost a bit on the currency recently, but that still looks an attractive place to be relatively. Do you know, and, and you know, you know me, I tend to be counter cyclical in everything I say, but a, a risky asset class that I think is starting to look really interesting is EM Local. So yes, the central banks there were earlier to go and they've been aggressively hiking in a more conventional fashion. They didn't wait to see the whites of the eyes of 8% inflation uh, they got going. So some of those longer dated yields are looking pretty attractive to me. Don't like the currency just yet. I'd still be hedging that. But the long end of the higher quality markets that have already got a significant amount of tightening under their belt, yeah. I think you can start to allocate uh, capital there and feel pretty decent that the long term prospects are attractive. James, we've run out of time for me to ask you about the weather in London, so we'll have to wait for it next time. James Athey, Christina Hooper with one of the best analogies of the day uh, with seeing that shark coming. Coming up, the morning calls and later retailers bearing the brunt of the sell-off. We'll speak to TPW's Jay Pulaski at the opening bell. Right now, we are looking at steep losses ahead of the open, headed for a bear market in the S&P. Uh, the Nasdaq well beyond that. Two-year yields rising to the highest levels going back to the end of 2000. 2007 and uh, 10 year yields hitting the low, high, hitting the highest, excuse me, prices down, yields up, highest going back to 2011. This is Bloomberg. Down to the open. I'm Lisa Abramowitz in for Jonathan Farrow, poised for a bear market. The loss is deepening ahead of this Monday on fears of inflation and higher rates to come. Time now for our morning calls. A look at some of the analyst recommendations on Wall Street this morning. First up, Summit Insights downgrading Micron to a hold, taking a more cautious view toward the memory market amid sluggish channel checks. Next up, BMO downgrading T Rowe Price to market perform, expecting consistent volatility to threaten upcoming earnings estimates. And finally, RBC upgrading Tesla to outperform $1,100 price target, target, highlighting the EV maker's favorable positioning and near-term setup. Coming up, it is poised to be brutal. Stocks flirting with yet another bear market. Treasury yields jumping to the highest levels in the front end, going back to 2007. Are we getting ahead of ourselves? That conversation coming up with TPW's Jay Pulaski. This is Bloomberg. Just seconds away from an ugly opening Monday. This is Countdown to the Open. I'm Lisa Abramowitz in for Jonathan Farrow. We can see uh, the red getting redder, particularly on the NASDAQ, down well uh, in excess, well north or south, I suppose, of 3%, down 3.1%. And we can see the S&P deepening their losses, 2.6%, all of this on the heels of higher yields. We could see two-year yields getting to the highest levels going back to 2007, 10-year yields. Uh, rising almost 13 basis points, 3.28 percent, the highest level since 2011. Dollar strength across the board, that has been the haven. The euro, 104.57, and crude uh, is softening a little bit, but still very much front and center has been gas prices and how much that pressures the consumer, how much that pressures businesses, how quickly that's been moving in the U.S. and beyond. Joining us now with a look at the stocks moving ahead of the opening bell or at the opening bell, here's Abigail Doolittle. Well, Lisa, simply a brutal st stock market sell-off this morning with the S&P 500, a redhead crossing the Bloomberg right now saying that the S&P 500 opens on track for a bear market down 20 percent from the record. But you made the point earlier that the Nasdaq and so many other markets, they're in deep, deep bear markets already. One reason for this, of course, tech selling off. Take a look at NVIDIA down 5 percent. This, of course, as yields are soaring and yield curves flattening. Oracle, which is defensive tech, NVIDIA is growthier momentum tech. Oracle is down 2 percent. So even your defensive old school tech is selling off on this. But of course, with yield curves flattening so much last week, Bank of America America, Morgan Stanley, all the big banks down sharply, down more than 2%. That uh, bank index down 2.5% itself. And of course, Morgan Stanley, 
not related and related at the same time. Lisa, of course, you know that Morgan Stanley's um, uh, strategist there, he has been calling for a, a brutal sell-off for quite some time, saying that the S&P 500 could potentially go to 3,400. Abigail, thank you so much. A lot of this has been driven by the rates market, the 10-year yield in particular, really driving some of the weak weakness that you saw in the tech space, surging to the highest level in a decade. It's continuing uh, to a uh, factor into the tech trade, which has had its worst week since January. For more Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow joining us from San Francisco. Ed. Yeah, good morning, Lisa. We're down 2.7% on the NASDAQ 100, pushing our year-to-date losses on that index toward 30%. You know, how quickly the psychology has changed since Friday, right? Hot inflation print, the market pricing in 175 basis points of hikes before September. And we go back to basics that higher rates discount the, the present value of future profits for tech companies, higher multiple tech companies. I always look at this chart. You look at the, the U.S. 10-year yield. There have been periods of the last 18 months where the yields push higher and Tech stocks, higher multiple tech stocks showing some resiliency, not sh so anymore. We're above that 3% threshold on the 10-year. And capitulation, do we use that word about the Nasdaq 100? It's a double whammy because there's also the recession fears angle if the Fed cannot deliver a soft landing, which is a window that's getting smaller and smaller, particularly the semiconductor space. You look at Micron, you were talking about this earlier, the downgrade in the market on concerns that memory chips in particular will not have a good second half of the year. Softness in the PC market and softness in the smartphone market as well. And now with rising yields, we are abandoning the conversation around dividends, right? Stocks that are paying out. Oil and natural gas producers, really yeah. interesting. You look at how they perform, but I think Bloomberg Intelligence has this idea, right, that $63 billion of free cash flow in that sector over the next two years. It could be one pocket where dividends continue to come because what else are you going to use the cash for? Ed Ludlow, thank you so much for that. It's not just big tech, it's also big box retailers feeling the bite from surging inflation. Global retailers, including the likes of Amazon, Target and Walmart, on pace for their first year of decline since 2008. Taylor Riggs mm. of Bloomberg joining us now for more. Taylor. Well, Lisa, I think it's great that this is following the segment on technology because we thought tech was bad. We thought the Nasdaq 100 was bad. Take a look at some of the individual uh, sort of sectors that we have for some of these retailers. And again, sort of underperforming, even big tech going back all the way since about 2008. So some big sort of underperformance here when we think about maybe the, and I don't want to say mismanagement, but the double ordering to get ahead of all of the supply chain issues. And then, of course, now the discounting, as you mentioned, Target, and sort of what follows when you think about the pressure that that puts on margins. Change up the board here because I think that it really has been all about this inventory story, not getting your hands on enough inventory. So all of that double ordering and now the discounting that comes with that. The only maybe good news from this, Lisa, is that all of that discounting could be heavily deflationary. And when you think about all the discounting then that is passed on to the retail and to the consumer, that actually might be a bright spot. Uh, but as you can see here, I mean, it, there is only one member within the retail index within the S&P that is positive for the year. Guess what that one is? It is Dollar Tree, which gives you a very good view here on the consumer, the search here for what they can afford, and of course the reflection in that within these equity markets. Taylor Riggs, thank you so much for that. Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs issuing a warning to investors exactly on the heels of that. The risks of facing uh, in earnings have yet to be priced in. The team at Morgan Stanley writing, quote, the equity risk premium does not reflect the risks to growth, which are increasing due to margin pressure and weaker demand as the consumer decides to hunker down. For more, Bloomberg's Keeley Line joins us now. Kaylee. Well, at least if anyone out there is hoping that maybe this is the worst of it, that now that the S&P 500 is on track for a bear market down 20 percent from its record high, maybe the bleeding will stop in the near term. Mike Wilson and David Costin would beg to differ and throw a little bit of cold water on that entire thesis. For David Costin's part, he says despite the sell-off we've seen in the S&P 500, valuations remain far from depressed and that earnings estimates are still too high and he expects them to be revised even further downward. Though it's worth noting his base case is still that the S&P 500 manages to end the year at 4,300, so about 10 percent north of Friday's close. Meanwhile, Mike Wilson decidedly more pessimistic. He is warning on that risk premium, as you mentioned. Right now, that S&P 500 earnings yield sub Attracted by the 10-year yield, sitting around 190, uh, 200 basis points or so. And he says that as recession risks grow, the equity risk premium should be higher until earnings estimates are cut. Now, his second warning 
surrounds consumer sentiment, which of course data showed on Friday has plunged to the lowest level since 1978, looking at those University of Michigan uh, data points. And he says that that drop in sentiment po poses a risk to the economy and markets from a demand standpoint. He talked about that excess inventory that Taylor was just detailing as well, saying that that is just now beginning to be reflected in stock prices. So where is that going to leave us eventually? He says he's looking at mid-August and he sees 3,400, Lisa. Kaylee Lyons, thank you so much. The S&P could be heading even lower. That's the view from RBC's Lori Calvacino, who joined us earlier this morning. She writes the following, quote, we see potential downside to a little over 3,200. That would represent a 32% drawdown in the S&P 500 from the early January 2022 high. Joining us now, so happy to say, TVW's Jay Pulaski. Jay, do you agree? Are we headed to 3,200? Or is this the cathartic puke that marks the bottom? My, my my God, Lisa, I mean, after that opening, I just want to crawl under my desk. I, mean, <laughs> I think a lot of people oh do. I think you're not alone. Uh, so give I mean, us I, some, I, I, uh, you know, cathartic yeah, puke talk. Yeah, give a, give a, well, give us some, something to, to look forward to. I mean, I don't know really who's selling after the worst back-to-back uh, -back two days and over two years. I mean, I think you've got to really be negative to be selling heavily um, uh, this morning. Uh, and that's not where we sit. So... I mean, I do think there are some uh, pockets of, of decent news. There are parts of the world that are outperforming. There are parts of the market that look like they're bottoming. Uh, for example, NASDAQ, uh, new lows uh, on Thursday and Friday were well, well short of the new lows in, uh, in mid-May. And so we're doing what the market does. It's a bottoming process, not a V bottom. Uh, and I think testing. Uh, the lows of May, and we'll see whether we uh, break considerably lower to the levels that uh, you were just noting, 32, 3,400. Uh, and I think that depends on whether or not we go into a recession. And I don't think that a recession uh, is baked in. I think, in fact, we're getting close to levels where we're starting to see demand destruction in the energy space. We've been waiting, like waiting for Godot for inflation to peak. Core has clearly peaked. And I think there's a case to be made that inflation will continue to ebb as we go over the next several months and quarters, whether it's softening labor market, easing housing, all uh, AHE, average hourly earnings having clearly peaked, uh, the one-off airfares up 40 percent year over year. Those types of things start to uh, fall out. And you have a handoff from goods inflation to service inflation. And I think that is a recipe for gradually rolling lower inflation. It's probably not going to be as low as I was thinking a month or two ago. Uh, so maybe 4% as we end the year. And we have 2.5% growth, so nominal growth of 6 to 7%, which I'll remind everyone is a full two percentage points above the nominal growth levels we had pre-COVID. So we are cheaper today than we were pre-COVID in terms of uh, the S&P on, on an equal weighted basis, selling at 15 times earnings. Earnings growth is better. Um, and unless we go into recession, that earnings growth should hold up. And therefore, you have an opportunity for high nominal growth, which supports the earnings growth. I think people still fail to grasp the importance of high nominal growth um, as it regards well, to earnings. Earnings are denominated in nominal dollars. Jay, would you be buying right now? I mean, the S&P just hit its lowest going back to March 2021. Are you a buyer based on what you were saying? Well, you know, I wrote uh, our monthly two weeks ago, and the title was The Time to Market and the Time to Invest. And clearly, it's not the time to market, Lisa, right? IPOs are shut, no high yield issuance in the United States, SPACs imploding, et cetera. Is it time to invest? I think arguably it is, def it is time to be looking to be more of a buyer. If you have a one to two year type of view, time frame, which is what we have at TPW Advisory, uh, Europe looks good to us, China looks good to us. Uh, the credit space in the U.S. looks good to us. We're getting paid to take risk. And we think the innovation space, uh, which uh, went into the bear market first back in February of 21, is looking like it's trying to bottom. And I'll just note, uh, we run two model portfolios. Our thematic model, 16 of the 20 positions are outperforming the ACWI uh, month to date. And then our global multi-asset model, 21 of 28 positions are outperforming. So value, energy, gold miners, uh, commodities, uh, China tech, uh, there are opportunities in areas where one can position, uh, I think, even in this market. It doesn't have to be all about the U.S. 
In fact, we're deeply underweight the U.S. equity market. Models start to break down when you factor in recession. Citigroup came out and said the premium for commodities is adding to the risks for growth, uh, writing in a note, quote, the longer the commodity shock persists, the bigger the negative impact on commodity consumers and on net global growth and equities. How does that pressure fit into this look outside of the U.S. to other commodity importers at a time of slowing growth and China not being the marginal driver of extra points for the GDP? Well, I think China is probably bottoming. And if you look, their aggregate financing in May was up 30 percent ahead of consensus and triple what it was the prior month. You have uh, markets like Brazil, which epitomize physical assets, uh, whether it's food, minerals or oil. Um, it's off about 15 percent over the last couple of weeks. It's an opportunity uh, to add there. And I think people, again, tend to forget that the percentage of disposable income yeah. used to purchase food and energy today is much less than it was in the 70s Whoa. and 80s. We use much less energy today to generate GDP than we did 30 years ago. It's not the same environment. Jay, you're sticking with us, and we're going to be speaking about China, China grappling with headwinds from home and abroad. We seek a region free of aggression and bullying. And we seek a world that respects territorial integrity and political independence. The conversation not only about the economic headwinds, but also the political ones as we discuss Taiwan and the potential for uh, further disruption in international relations. Right now, we are looking at steep losses. The S&P down 2.7 percent. Uh, the Nasdaq actually clawing back some of the earlier losses, though still down steeply, uh, more than 3 percent now. So really, uh, really adding to the losses to near 30 percent decline so far this year. This is Bloomberg. We seek a region free of aggression and bullying. And we seek a world that respects territorial integrity and political independence. And we feel the headwinds from threats and intimidation and the obsolete belief in a world carved up into spheres and influence. Headwinds piling up at home and abroad, China grappling with pushback from the United States. This coming as the country starts to reimpose COVID restrictions. Bloomberg's Michael McKee is back with us for more. Mike. Lisa, it's uh, more bad news from China. China, China, China. Can't get away from it. COVID now making a reappearance in a big way in Beijing. 45 cases reported on Monday afternoon. That follows 37 in Shanghai. Shanghai had gotten down to single digits. And so at this point, uh, we are looking at the possibility of another big backup in Chinese supply chains. And these are the ships that are waiting offshore and the supply chains that are waiting to be filled in China. And all that has to come to the United States and to Europe. And so it looks like we could have more economic problems. And of course, uh, the problem that we have on Wall Street is that business is not very good in China right now, in part because of all this, in part because of the Chinese government, which has called in a number of bankers, including Credit Suisse, Goldman Sachs, and uh, UBS, to say, Watch how much you pay your bankers. We don't want them to be overcompensated. It's part of Xi Jinping's efforts to uh, create a more equal society there. And that doesn't really go well on Wall Street. But you saw the chart. Uh, we are seeing a lot fewer IPOs of Chinese uh, companies because, well, we don't know. Is it because of the business they're doing with Wall Street? Or is it because of the lockdowns? Or is it because of just a general uh, bad news in the markets kind of thing. Uh, this is the problem going forward, Lisa, as uh, we try to figure out what's going on with China. So many things, that it's hard to put a finger on just one. Mike, thank you so much. Uh, sticking with China, although we do have an eye toward markets with them really whipping around the NASDAQ, uh, really and particularly volatile ahead of the Fed on Wednesday, possibly signaling a more aggressive tact. In China, a growing number of firms on the street have actually been turning more bullish on that nation's stocks. With the team over at Jeffries writing, quote, China is almost operating two economies in parallel. The first is the COVID economy requiring mass testing at times and an ongoing reporting of infections. Meanwhile, the real economy is helping 
helped by the government's supportive policies. Jay Pulaski, who is also being uh, also seeing value in some of the equities and other assets in China, joining us uh, now. Jay, how much is that kind of policy support underpinning the reason why you see some signs to be optimistic there? Absolutely critical, Lisa. I mean, you think about the policy mix in the United States, it's probably the worst of the three main regions, the Americas, Europe, and the U.S., with tight fiscal and tight monetary policy. If you look at Europe, it's loose fiscal and starting to move into tighter monetary, but very slowly. If you look at Asia, and I would include Japan in this, you have both loose fiscal and loose monetary policy, and that is supporting uh, financial assets. And I noted in the prior segment that uh, aggregate financing in May in China was 30 percent ahead of consensus and triple the prior number. So uh, we look at KWeb, which is the tech stocks. We look at the A shares. We have both in our model portfolios. KWeb bottomed uh, back in March three months ago. The regulatory picture is getting better. Valuation is very compelling. They're trading at half the multiples of the NASDAQ uh, 100. Um, and so to us, it's one of the real opportunities and we're overweight uh, China assets, both stocks and bonds. Jay, a lot of people make this argument that you follow the policy prescription, you follow the one that's most accommodative. When does that break down in the face of inflation, given the fact that in the United States, yes, there is a, an expected greater tightening than in other regions, but it is also in response to that nominal growth that's supporting some of the earnings that we've seen so far? No, you make a great point, Lisa. Inflation's key. And in Japan and in China, guess what? No inflation. Right. I mean, Japan uh, is happy to have a little bit of inflation finally, which is why they're not pushing back so aggressively against the weakening yen. And in China's case, uh, uh, CPI for uh, May was 2 percent and PPI, which is what uh, people focus on from the industrial side of the economy, was half of what it was in the prior month. So it's gone from 12 percent to 6 percent. So there really isn't an inflation issue in China. And that's what allows them to have the policy flexibility, which they really haven't put to use. We've been actually disappointed at the uh, degree of policy flexibility shown by China, perhaps because there's some dichotomy in the upper uh, levels of the Communist Party over how to address that mix between zero COVID and keeping the economy on track. I got to say, Jay, uh, I like your brightness. It's a good antidote to some of the gloom that we're seeing right now. Just to give you a sense, the Nasdaq's down 3.1 percent, the S&P down 2.5 percent, two-year yields markedly higher than they were earlier this morning, although they've been bouncing around, but solidly above the 3.2 percent mark after having fallen below that. We are looking right now very much at a bear market, but we're also looking at dollar strength. Jay, when does that break down if what you're saying is the right way to look at this, follow the policy support, not necessarily where the strength in earnings is now. Yeah, no, again, Lisa, you're, you're right on it. I mean, the dollar has, in our view, we've been wrong about the dollar. We've been expecting the dollar to roll over. It's really hurt in terms of the ability to hedge some of the non-U.S. equity, which we didn't do and we should have. But the dollar's not been able to really break out here either, even with rates, as you point out very correctly, really leading the process. To us, this is a rates-driven market. The two-year, the front end in particular, has has soared. It's, it's risen about 280 basis points since the Fed started to tighten. Typically, in a whole cycle, the two-year doesn't rise that much. The average at this point in a Fed tightening cycle for the two-year is less than 100 basis points. It's almost 280 basis points. So far in this cycle, we have front ended an awful lot of this. If we get one, we talked about the Carthetic uh, puke. If we get one real inflation number that's soft and allows people to really commit to the idea that the core has, has peaked and is rolling over, um, then we get an absolute you know, buy that's gone, that goes crazy. Otherwise, maybe we need that cathartic puke that VIX over 40 to really get people to come back in. To me, the last couple of weeks, the action in the market hasn't been heavy selling. As I pointed out, new lows in the NASDAQ were, were small. It's been lack of buyers. Yeah. Jay Pulaski, thank you so much for that insult and that point, uh, in, for, for not that insult, for that uh, insight, I should say. I really like that point that you were making. That's where I was going with that, uh, that really it's been a lack of buyers. Coming up, the market moving events that you need to be watching. That's next in our trading, trading diary. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg's The Open. I'm Lisa Abramowitz in for Jonathan Farrow. Time now for the trading diary. You need to be watching this week. U.S. PPI figures coming on Tuesday. Retail sales out Wednesday, followed by a trifecta of central bank rate decisions. First up, Fed and Chair Powell's news conference on Wednesday, the Bank of England on Thursday, and finally wrapping up the week with the Bank of Japan on Friday. Right now in markets, it has been an ugly start to the day, although you do have some who are starting to creep in to buy. NASDAQ down 2.8%. This is Bloomberg.